designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is Calibrate Real Estate. Broadcasting from the Mile High City. Thank you for tuning in to the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and we are simulcast on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, thank you. And please give us a five-star review if you love this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, come on over to Apple Podcasts. Do a download, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate you. Well, today is an episode that was really born out of my last discussion, my interview with Ryan Glass. Ryan and I were talking about how you handle stress, how you deal with burnout, frustration, things not going your way. And all of us in the real estate industry know that that's going to happen Sometimes it happens multiple times in one day. (laughs) But I will say to you that it's important to have these moments where you can understand that you're having a bad day, you're having a bad situation that's not turning out the way you would like it to. And what do you do? Well, this podcast is titled Find Your Happy Place. And when I was speaking with Ryan Glass in an earlier episode, we talked about the fact that one of my coworkers, talks about his happy place. Uh, One of his happy places is that he goes into the car wash. And in the car wash, he feels like at some times he's in a cocoon, in a womb, if you will, as the little washers flip flap around his car. And as the suds go over the windshield, he feels like not only is he cleaning his car on the outside, making it look squeaky clean, but he's also washing off all of the stresses of the day. And he feels like that's a moment where because of the ambient noise, because of that white noise of the car wash, he's feeling like he is able to focus, maybe able to meditate, maybe able to say a little prayer and get his mind right before he goes home. Well, that, uh, That thing, that idea of finding your happy place made me think of a great movie that I love, Happy Gilmore. So if you have never watched Happy Gilmore, I've watched it, gosh, about uh, probably six dozen times, maybe maybe more than that, maybe uh, maybe 100 times or 200 times. Everybody needs to find their happy place to combat pressure, stress, and burnout. Well, Happy Gilmore was copyrighted by Universal Studios. I'm going to give credit where credit's due in 1996, over two decades ago. For those of you like myself that was a teen in the 90s, I can't believe that that was 20 years ago. But such is life. Life goes on. We all get older. All right. So Happy Gilmore, as you might know, stars Adam Sandler, also of Billy Madison and gazillion other blockbuster hits. Fame, um, the DVD that I was just holding up, if you're watching on YouTube, was uh, a simul, uh, double feature, excuse me, of Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. It uh, features Adam Sandler, Julie Bowen of Modern Family fame. Many of you may not have known that, but that's the mom from Modern Family when she was quite a bit younger. And Carl Weathers. It was written by Tim Herlihy. In Adam Sandler. And I particularly like that Tim Hurley, he was one of the writers, one of the main writers, because my grandmother, her maiden name is Hurley. Just a fun fact. So let's set the scene. Let's get into Happy Gilmore. And why in the world does this even pertain to real estate? Well, I'll tell you why. Grandma didn't pay her taxes. And I'm, I'm guessing they don't specify it, but I'm guessing she had back real estate taxes. Grandpa built the house with his own hands. So two real estate applications right there, taxes and building a home. $270,000 in back taxes. The house was repossessed. Okay, so that's our scene. Grandma didn't pay her taxes. Grandpa had built the house. The uh, governmental agencies that be are taking the house back because of 270 grand in back taxes. Now, again, remember, this is 20 years ago. So that's quite a bit of money. So grandma has to move out. 
into a nursing home for the elderly. And, and Ben Stiller plays a great uh, villain or a sub villain. He's not the main villain in the movie, but he plays a great villain as he's got uh, this little sweatshop operation of grandma's and grandpa's quilting for him. If you've seen the movie, happy is a hockey player, well, kind of a crummy hockey player turned golfer to save the family home. So that's the scene. The hero is Happy Gilmore. That's Adam Sandler. The guide is Chubbs Peterson. That's Carl Weathers. The villain is the infamous Shooter McGavin, Christopher McDonald. The girl, you know, every hero has got to get the girl at the end of the story. If you remember building a story brand and some of the stuff that we did as it pertained to Don Miller's great marketing book, the girl is Virginia Bennett, which is Julie Bowen. All right. So we've got a lot of pressure on the PGA Tour. I mean, everybody knows it. If you watch golf or even if you're just a casual observer of golf, I mean, you've seen just people crumble. Golf fans will know Greg Norman had lots of almost victories that ended in utter defeat in second place. A lot of famous situations like that there. They follow golfers that never get to a major championship. Phil Mickelson eventually got to a major championship. Sergio Garcia eventually got to a major championship, but they track how many majors these guys played in. And there's four majors every year that they don't win and it's these stars that just kind of crumble under pressure so there's a lot of pressure on the pga tour right at the beginning of the movie happy after talking with some movers that were moving all of grandma's stuff out because it was being repossessed they bet happy that he can't hit a golf ball because of the funny way he's swing uh swinging the golf club and because he's a hockey player and he makes fun of the golf guys anyways and uh, all of a sudden he crushes this drive and they go, man, you should play on the tour. You should do the Waterbury Open. So Happy wins the Waterbury Open, barely, okay? And what happens on his first day on the PGA Tour, he meets this guru, this goofball, if you will, Kevin Nealon. That has played the, uh, the actor Kevin Nealon from Saturday Night Live fame and a buddy of Sandler's plays the character of Gary Potter. Gary Potter, he's the guru. And Gary says to Adam uh, Sandler as Happy Gilmore, you must rise above it. Harness good energy, block bad. Harness good, block bad. If you remember that, plays this goofy scene of that. And so what ends up happening is Sandler realizes that he can make some money and he gets all these checks after each tournament, another real estate application, of course. Okay. So as real realtors, as real estate agents, as realtors, we get commission checks and happy has each tournament on the PGA tour and he gets these checks and you've probably seen it, you know, charities do this. They hold the big vanity check, the gigantic check while well, shooter McGavin, the kingpin of the tour wins all these big first place prize money. They show him holding up a $200,000 check Gilmore, gets asks for checks after each tournament when he wins 45th place and then 21st place and then 18th place and then ninth place. And so he's getting better and better and better. And shooter McGavin is starting to notice. Okay. Shooter's starting to notice he's jealous at the attention that happy's getting because shooter's been playing golf all of his life. Happy is a crummy hockey player that couldn't even make it into the NHL or any type of pro hockey, frankly. And He's playing better in some ways than Shooter is. He's able to draw, uh, drive the ball farther, and Shooter gets jealous. So we set the scene now where Shooter has, and, and there's just always this animosity between the villain, McGavin, and the hero, Gilmore. Shooter hires a heckler. The heckler's name really is funny because it's Doug. And Doug starts heckling Happy Gilmore. Happy's paired with Bob Barker in this pro-am. And uh, that heckler gets Gilmore to not hit the heckler, which is what Gilmore's famous for. He's famous for, famous for playing with raw emotion and tenacity and just kind of being like a hockey player on the golf course. So he has a fist fight with, with Bob Barker and Bob Barker is a cameo in the movie. And that's a hilarious scene. If you remember it. So he gets fined 25 grand and more importantly, the suspension for a month. Gilmore has been winning all these checks. He's getting better and better. And all of a sudden the moneymaker doesn't enable him to make um, make these tour victory checks from 
playing golf because he's suspended. So what ends up happening? He's got two events left and the heckler, um, the idea was that there's this deadline, right? There's the deadline of the house being repossessed and there's a scene where there's an auction. So happy is kind of two events away from that two weeks left gets fined also gets suspended. And he's like sitting in there at subway with Julie Bowen, Virginia Bennett is the character. She's the publicist for the PGA tour. He's like, how am I going to make money? How am I going to save grandma's house? Because he's short of the $270,000 tax bill that needs to be paid. So as he's describing this beautiful cold cut combo he's about to eat, Julie as a publicist, Julie Bowen, Virginia Bennett as the publicist, realizes we've got a sponsorship opportunity. And so he gets a sponsorship from Subway, gets the money, goes to the auction and figures, hey, maybe I actually can buy this house for less than the $270,000 that was owed in back taxes. Well, he finds out pretty quickly that the bids are, are go rising above that and someone wins the auction at $350,000. Happy had gotten $275,000, who was way off, despondent, and then he sees that it's his nemesis, Shooter McGavin. So Happy makes a wager because Shooter won the auction for $350,000. And he was saying, what do you want? And, and Shooter says, of course, you know what I want. I want you off the tour. You're a shame. So Happy says, fine, I'll do that. And, and Virginia Bennett says, no way, you're not doing that. You know, grandma can live in a nice condo. You've got all this money. You can, you can get her somewhere else. He's like, that's not my grandpa's house. That is not the house that my grandpa built with his hands. So he has a very powerful purpose, a very powerful why, a reason to get his grandma's house back. So the wager is, number one, he gets the house if he wins the tour championship. Number two, if Happy Gilmore doesn't win the tour championship, if he loses head-to-head -head against Shooter McGavin, he's going to quit the golf tour. So what's to, what's to happen here? Because Happy basically is just known for kind of lucking his way into the standings by having huge drives, but he doesn't have a very good short game. And the short game, for those of you who aren't golfers and those who are golfers, know that the short game is really all about fundamentals. If you can hit the ball a long way. But if you can't make your approach shot, your chips and your putts, you're not going to score par. You're not going to do very well. So Happy reunites with his guide, his guru, played again by Carl Weathers. This is Chubbs Peterson, a, a tour pro at a um, driving range. That's where they met. And they go to Happy Land is the name of this mini golf place. And he starts to learn how to putt with Chubbs. So as you can imagine, in any type of mini golf experience, they create all this craziness, all these wild putts, all these bank it off the wall here, go over this loop-de-loop, -loop, or in some cases, it's got the clown's mouth that you're trying to hit it into at the very end. It's kind of this carnival of golf experiences, right? It is nothing like a real golf course, but that's why it's putt-putt golf, it's mini golf, it's fun. And it's really hilarious because Sandler gets as Happy Gilmore as his character gets totally frustrated, totally PO'd, totally angry, and he, he hits two signs. If you'll notice this, if you focus really in the two signs he hits, one says, have fun, and the other says, keep smiling. So these are sitting there at one of the holes of the mini golf course, and it says, have fun and keep smiling, and he knocks him down because he's so frustrated. So the clown scene is, is kind of the end before you get to this chaos. And what ends up happening is Chubbs turns to Gilmore, turns to Happy and says, don't play with raw emotion. Clear your mind. Stay focused. And this, if you've seen the movie, is the earthquake scene where it shows this big earthquake. It's kind of this California scene and a skyscraper drops down and falls halfway, breaks halfway down and falls right in front of the putt-putt golf ball and Happy's like, how am I supposed to putt now? So what happens is Chubb says, think of a place that's perfect. Think of a place that's perfect, your own happy place. Think of a place that's perfect, your own happy place. Go there and all of your anger will disappear. So of course, if you've seen the movie, and look, this is a PG-13 movie, so it's not appropriate to say what 
Happy's happy place is like, what Gilmore's happy place is like. But we all know what happens next. He sees his happy place and it's sort of uh, all white and kind of the filter fuzzy. And he sees scenes of things that make him happy and happy places best after remembering what makes him happy. He plays in the zone. This clears his mind. Shooter starts to choke once we play in golf tournaments. When he gets to golf tournaments and he gets to the tour, Shooter starts to choke as Gilmore realizes that he can putt, or Gilmore realizes now that he can putt, and Shooter sees it. Okay, so what you know is that we go back to Happy's apartment after the earthquake hole, after the um, clown mouth hole at the mini golf putt putt. So Chubbs and Happy go back to his apartment. Chubb says, look, now you've made it. He's the guide. And he gives him a special putter. It's a modified putter. It's an Odyssey putter branded that looks like a hockey stick. He says, you're a hockey player that plays golf. I want to give you something that feels comfortable. And it was actually Chubb's putter that he retrofitted to make look like a hockey stick. So then Happy gives him a gift. And it's an alligator that bit off Chubb's hand. Chubbs gets surprised, falls out the window, and he dies. It's part of the, um, you know, kind of satirical comedy. So you find out at this point when Virginia Bennett and Happy Gilmore are ready to go into the tour championship, you find out that in addition to Chubbs, the mentor, the guy dying, you also find out that Happy's dad died. And now it makes even more sense as to why Happy is so purposeful about finding a way to make sure that he gets grandma's house back because he lived with grandma and for those of you that may have had a situation like that where you've ever been away from home you know i i didn't i wasn't away from my parents forever but there was a period of time where i lived away from my parents while my brother had open heart surgery i was little i was like six or seven years old and even though you're living with your aunt and uncle and your cousins it doesn't feel like home and so um you know something about the maternal grandmother makes him feel like this is his only home, this is his only family, because you hear that his father died. And so what ends up happening is Virginia Bennett, the girl, played by Julie Bowen, reminds Happy to, to just remember everything that Chubb taught you. Because he doesn't feel like he can play in the tournament, he certainly doesn't feel like he can beat Shooter McGavin after Chubb's death. Well, Shooter comes right by after that, after that little moment and we're at the memorial and he says, he antagonizes Happy by saying he blames you, blames Happy for Chubb's death. Shooter decides he's also going to dedicate his tournament performance to Chubb's memory. Holy cow. <laughs> so he's paired with Shooter McGavin in the tour championship, of course, you know, as, as you know, if you play golf, you're paired with a lot of different people and the odds are that you're going to be paired with someone that's kind of of your playing stature. And as the tournament progresses, if it's a multi-day tournament, they reset the pairings based on who's best and who's worst. And so typically the top two players play with each other. So what ends up happening is shot for shot, Happy's competing with Shooter. Not only is he hitting the long ball, these huge drives that he's known for as this ex-hockey player that's got huge, powerful drives, he also has learned how to chip and putt. And he, there's several funny scenes where he goes, oh my gosh, you know, somebody's closer. <laughs> so on the final day of this tournament, because it's a multi-did tournament, it's a big tour championship, Shooter calls back the heckler, Donald. Donald was the guy that would get in uh, Happy's way when he was playing with Bob Barker in San Francisco on that soggy tournament earlier in the in the in the movie and he got in his head he would just mess with Gilmore and force Happy to take his frustration out on his playing partner Bob Barker so you see this scene where Shooter is trying to drive like Happy and can't do it he keeps missing the ball and then he pops out his old school probably Motorola Motorola cell phone because one of those old ones with the flip thing and there's several Motorola sponsorship things in the movie so it's probably a Motorola and he's standing there and he says Donald I need you I need you for business because Donald wants thinks he wants to go to Sizzler or Red Lobster <laughs> so Donald comes back on this final day of the championship and he actually runs into Happy with his Volkswagen bug Happy's hurt and he loses his greatness he loses that ability to hit the long ball sort of like Samson or Superman. Samson getting his hair cut by Delilah. 
or Superman hitting kryptonite. All of a sudden, Happy tries to swing, he hits a ball, and for once, Shooter outdrives him. It's the first time that that happens, and you can tell that no longer is Happy immortal. Happy is mortal. You know, you see that in his short drive. So things get worse for Happy in this tournament. He was winning at one point and he gets lost in the woods. And don't we all get lost in the woods at times? And I find it interesting that with golf, you're in the woods or you're in the rough or you're in the weeds, all things that we talk about with stress and with life. So Happy's in the woods. There's this moment where he remembers, okay, yeah, that's right. Because Virginia Bennett told him to remember what Chubbs told him. Find your happy place. Go to your happy place. So he tries to go back to that happy place that he envisioned at the putt-putt golf course while he's in the woods and while he's struggling. And it turns out to be horrible because Shooter's in the scene and he's messing with Happy's happy place and he's kind of the devil all dressed in black and everybody else was um, supposed to make Happy feel like he was happy. So what ends up happening right after he tries to envision that is grandma's there. Grandma came from the nursing home, had never been at any of Happy's tour stops because as the PGA goes, you're traveling all over. She would watch him on TV, but grandma's there and Virginia Bennett says, Happy, look, someone, someone's here to see you. And grandma says something very important. Happy, you look upset. And he can say, you can see that, that Happy Gilmore looks upset. And she reminds him, grandma reminds him, don't worry about the house. It's just a house. I want you to be happy. And then happy remembers what his purpose was. He sees it there embodied and he remembers, this is what I'm doing it for. So we all know what happens next. Happy plays his best after remembering what his purpose was. What makes him happy? It's grandma, it's home. And he starts playing in the zone. Shooter now starts to choke. This is the final round of the, of the tour championship. And Shooter's got his ball on the 18th green. He drives it into the woods. Happy drives it right onto the green. I mean, it looks, as they're tied, and I remember the scoreboard, it was five under for McGavin, Shooter McGavin, five under for Gilmore, Happy Gilmore. So got this scene, 18th green, two drives. And this happens whenever you're playing in any competitive sport. You start to compare yourself with someone else. And this may happen when you're in your own brokerage company may happen with someone that you're competing with in the office. We had a discussion with one of our children who's a competitive swimmer literally this week who is frustrated because they swim against a very, very talented person that's in an age group that's one age older than them. I'm not going to say the child's name. I'm not going to say the competitor's name. But let's just say that one is 10 and one is nine. All right. So when you've got someone who's just a little bit older than you, and frankly, has been doing it longer than you. What ends up happening is that swimmer in my family doesn't realize that they are the second best swimmer in some of these races on the team. Sometimes they're third best, but they're in the top three of all of the people in this age group, but they can't catch that one person. And so Shooter is now feeling this way as Shooter's in the woods. He's scrambling is what you call it in, in golf. And don't we scramble in real estate brokerage too? Lots of good parallels between golf and brokerage because it's an individual sport. You don't really play on a team in golf unless you're playing in the Ryder Cup or some other uh, match play event. So you're really playing for yourself. You're playing for your own pride. You're playing for your family. You're playing for your hometown. You're playing for what's important to you. So Shooter is feeling like he might be like Phil Mickelson, like Sergio Garcia, or maybe even worse, like Greg Norman. These great golfers who win lots of tournaments during the year, but when it comes to the big one at the end of the year, they just keep missing. Now, we know that Phil and we know that Sergio ended up winning. They ended up coming through, but Greg Norman never did. And so you're starting to feel that way, like, uh-oh, Shooter's not going, to, not going to make it. And you feel like it's a certain win for Happy. Well, movies don't work this way, of course. So Shooter's in the woods. All of a sudden, Shooter chips out after Happy's on the green because Happy is Happy is in the lead position then because he's on the green. And so Shooter is what you call away. And it's because his ball is farther and it's off the green, Shooter goes next. Well, he chips up right onto the green. And all of a sudden, 
even though it's farther than happy, feels like he's got a putt, he could par and they're tied. Remember they're five under and five under. So what ends up happening is shooter is still away because his ball is farther away on the green, putts in for a tie. Then what happens is that Volkswagen bug that hit happy at the beginning. Remember Donald, the crazy heckler hits happy um, at the beginning of this tournament, at the beginning of this final round of the tournament. All of a sudden, that Volkswagen bug plays a very important scene because all of Happy's fans, all of the people that are coming out in droves to see Happy, all of his fans, all the people want to get a better look at Happy. And they come up to the top of this tower that the VW bug had crashed into. And Donald ran away earlier in the scenes, flaming his arm on fire and trying to pat it out as a crazy guy. (laughs) All of a sudden, that tower falls down, and it falls right in between Happy's ball and the hole. Obstacle, right? What do we do when we have an obstacle? Well, if you can't go through it, you go around it. Can't go around it, you go under it. Can't go under it, go over it. Find a way. Get some dynamite, you blast through it, whatever it is. But if something's in your way, you know as a top producer, Or if you've seen a top producer and you don't feel like you're there yet, they find a way to overcome. So Happy remembers that earthquake scene at the mini putt-putt with Chubbs. And he's like, I've seen this before. And he does the classic like ding, dong, ding, ding, dong, ding, dong, dong, clunk, and putts it all the way through this maze of tangled metal and banners from this big TV tower that fell down when the Volkswagen bug hit it. And he sinks the putt. Sinks it for a birdie because Virginia Bennett says, happy, you know, you could go ahead and putt around it and then putt it in and force a playoff. Because remember, Shooter was in at a par, but happy goes, no, I want to win now. And I'm going to win that gold jacket. So he ends up winning the gold jacket, except for Shooter tries to take it from him. And you know that scene where Mr. Larson goes and starts like chasing after him, sort of like Frankenstein. So Happy gets the girl. It's the uh, classic ending of where the hero gets the girl and everybody's happy. And at the end, they all reunite. It's grandma and it's happy and it's Virginia. And they're all together with the caddy. They're all together there and they're toasting champagne. Happy's wearing his gold jacket. He's triumphant and he's looking at the house that he won back fair and square from Shooter. And you remember... When he won that tournament, he said, let's go home. And that's a very important statement that if you're out there in the field, if you're grinding, if you're in the summer, like we are right now, and you feel like, man, I am just persevering and I am running, I am tired, tour stop after tour stop after tour stop, and you feel that grind, just remember, sometimes it's okay to rest and go home, go to your happy place. So some lessons that I learned as you're at that final scene and you're seeing in over the house, you know, uh, Virginia and grandma are like, what are you looking at? Because they can't see it. Happy is envisioning it's the crocodile, it's Chubbs, and it's Abe Lincoln. (laughs) For what a classic Sandler end of scene moment where it's like, we're going to throw some comedy in there. But that's Happy's new happy place. He's seeing grandma's house. He's triumphant. And then he sees Chubbs. He sees the alligator that he vanquished for Chubbs and he sees Abe Lincoln. And some of the things that I think about here, are some lessons, act like yourself. So act like yourself. Don't get outside of your own self. And I remember that what would happen when I was a little kid, I'd be in grade school and people would say, don't act too big for your britches or be yourself. And I was like, what does that mean? Be your authentic self, be unique Be the one person. God made you as an individual that no one else is like. There's 7 billion people on this planet. Several hundred million people living in the United States. Just be yourself and uh, bring your own unique ability. So Happy, his big deal was, you know, hey, I hit the long drive. And that was what he made a splash in the industry, in the golfing industry for. So what can you make a splash in the real estate industry? You know, for me, I'm a commercial realtor. And I have specialized with, uh, with investors with selling rental property, specifically apartment buildings in Denver for almost two decades, over one decade and a half at this point. And I'm continuing to do that. But I'm also differentiating myself as the guy with the podcast. 
some of the haters are like, oh, what are you doing? Podcast company out there? No, we run a commercial brokerage company that is really, really good at selling apartment buildings. We also sell houses. We can do office leases. We can do industrial. We can do all of that. But the way that I got my start was in a niche. My long drive, if you will, was selling apartment buildings. So that's what I brought. My unique ability was doing that and being myself in that industry. And that's how I broke in. And then once you break in, you can develop your game. And that's what Happy did. He realized, okay, I can make it on the tour, but I can't be a pro. I can't be a pro's pro, the top of my game, if I don't learn how to chip and if I don't learn how to putt. My approach shots, my number two, three, and four shots in the game of golf, most of the holes you play are par four. You've got to get those approach shots. Your drive doesn't matter if you're hitting three and four, even if you're on the green, hitting three and four shots before you get to, to get the ball in the hole. So what ends up happening, I think, for a lot of us is we forget that, that golf, real estate brokerage life is all about fundamentals. And you can make a big splash. You can go on the scene for doing something big. But then what happens? What happens? You've still got to grind away. You've still got to practice. To be at the top of your game, you've got to be that practitioner. Well, I wanted to share all of those notes with you today because Happy Gilmore, for me, Find Your Happy Place was just a really cool example, a cool analogy for life and professionalism and brokerage. And one of the things I want to share with you is that I asked our 30 under 30 alumni group what they wanted to share as their happy place. I had mentioned my coworker that said his happy place was driving through the car wash, right? Remember that at the beginning where I said that, you know, the car wash just takes all of the dirt off the car, but it literally cleanses him uh, at the end of the day before he goes home. Well, for me, here's a couple of my happy places. And then I'll share with you some of the 30 under 30 happy places. So for me, one of my happy places when I'm at work is getting out of the office, going on a walk. We office here in Washington Park, having the ability to go walk in the park, which is a little bit of speed, walking exercise, walking at a good pace, breaking up that, that monotony of the day sometimes and giving yourself this moment of like, okay, I'm gonna change my scene. And I used to do this all the time at different offices before we in Wash Park. And I never realized that that's actually a thing. That is actually something that helps you break up your day and it recenters you and sets your, your mind right. And I read it through High Performance Habits by Brendan Bouchard. That's a book that I'm reading right now by Brendan Bouchard. And Brendan describes that, that high performers typically stop activities that they're doing every 52 minutes is the, is the app that he found that did this high performance study and they found that 52 minutes, now everybody thinks kind of 60 minute blocks, right? An hour block. It's actually right before the hour. Give yourself eight minutes to walk around, go get a drink of water, use the restroom, go on a walk, power walk, get, get your blood pumping, get your circulation going. And then at the top of the hour, get back to your activity. So I've been doing that for years and then realized like, that's a thing. Okay. So then the other part of it too, is I did a presentation earlier this year for the Bakersfield Association of Realtors. And you probably heard that on a podcast if you're a, a subscriber. One of the things that I learned by reading a Harvard Business Review, making of a corporate athlete, is that they said that athletes, if you'll notice this, especially golfers and tennis players, they have all these little ticks, maybe even baseball players. As you know, the batter, every single time he steps in the batter's box, they'll do the same adjustments, adjust his batting gloves and adjust his uh, wrist warmers and adjust his sweatbands and adjust his socks and his shirt. And all of a sudden it's like the same thing. I'm buddies with a guy in our neighborhood who played at a very high level in the NCAA football scene here at CSU. And he would say he was constantly, as he was getting up to the line, adjusting his shoulder pads. And it was kind of this nervous tick, but it gets you set, gets you, get your mindset. So besides golfers and football, or sorry, excuse me, besides, um, football players and baseball players, I had mentioned golfers and tennis players. You will notice golfers waggle. They waggle their club. They have an approach. They may take a practice shot or two or three. Someone says something big or there's a crowd noise from the other green in a tournament. They'll step away from their ball and they'll do their pre-approach before they hit the ball. Tennis players, you'll see them constantly looking at the strings of their racket, almost like, did I break that? 
was, is the racket all of a sudden broken? Is there a hole in it? Cause I am such a good server. <laughs> and the answer is no, but what they're doing is they're focusing on the minutia to get themselves set right back into what they need to do. They're finding their happy place. So that's something that I learned as I'm thinking about my happy place. Now, the 30 under 30 crew, what do you think their happy place was? Well, I put out a poll and overwhelming the support was for exercise. Exercise was an overwhelming stat in the votes for finding their happy place. Some of the fun ones was rollerblading. That was something I had never thought of before, but rollerblading was one of the things that came up in the exercise component of finding your happy place. That was really cool. <laughs> um, going for a hike, one of my coworkers said, getting out in the mountains, seeing beautiful scenery, seeing what God made and realizing that this world is so huge and you're a very small part of it. And that's appropriate, right? I mean, humility, being humble is understanding that God is God and you are not God. And you can accomplish some amazing things, but you know what? This world has a savior and it is not you. Your clients may need you at times, but you can also take a break. If you're feeling burnt out, if you're feeling uh, messed up, if you're feeling like you're in the woods, if you're feeling like you're in that spot where you're not happy, you're grumpy, and you're bringing that to every conversation, you can step back, find your happy place, go on a hike. One of the things I love, and I've mentioned this, and anybody who follows my dog, Boomer Bear, on Instagram, it's a good follow, by the way, if you haven't heard, if you haven't seen that, you'll know that we go to the open space right one block away from my house. We have this beautiful open space. I live on the corner in a neighborhood called Homestead. Walk right down the hill, right past Homestead Elementary. Beautiful open space. Boom. Awesome. And uh, Boomer and I love to run in the open space because you see all sorts of wildlife. You see uh, different topography. It's just gorgeous and it's open. I read a study once that with how dense New York City is, specifically Manhattan, which is an island, New York City would, would not thrive the way that it does if it didn't have Central Park, if it didn't intentionally have the margin of this gigantic park called Central Park where everybody pours into Central Park. Think about how valuable that real estate is, Central Park not being developed, but the point is it's an open space. It's an area to have people get out, chill out. They're not in their office. They're not in their home. And sometimes when it feels like the walls are closing in, the best thing to do, my mom would say, is get fresh air, get outside. One of the things Courtney and I dealt with a lot when the kids were toddlers, when the twins were little babies and Charlotte was just a toddler, is we felt like the walls were closing in and we just sometimes needed to get outside. And that was the hardest when it was cold because you would feel like you got cabin fever. And that's a real thing. So finally, as you think about your happy place, let's go over this poll that the 30 under 30 group on Facebook poll uh, oriented here. It was awesome. So exercise, overwhelmingly number one. A couple other things that we saw, some other trend lines, meditation and prayer, um, not necessarily number two, but that, that got a bunch of votes. Um, shopping, you know, that was something that uh, some people said, hey, that makes me feel good. We know that people love to go boating, love to go up to the mountains, love to go to the lake, fishing. Not necessarily exercise, but quiet time, reflection, that monotonous, and, and, and not to say finish, fishing is monotonous, but anybody that knows how to fish, you cast, you reel it in. You cast, you reel it in, and it's, it's quiet, and it's peaceful. So fishing was one of them. Some other things were hanging out with besties, therapy. Now, I'll tell you that therapy is one of these um, – one of these game changers that I have embraced in the last two years, I'm going to be vulnerable for a moment as we close here, that therapy is one of those things for me that has absolutely set my mind right. And I knew that I loved to communicate because I've constantly had coaches. I've constantly sought out mentors throughout my entire career. And so the idea of coaching, the idea of finding a mentor, finding a guru, finding that guide like Chubbs and Donald Miller talks about that in building a story brand that was really innate to me. That was really intuitive. But one of the things that I was, frankly, as a man, uh, pretty apprehensive about, and some of this had to do with some earlier experiences with uh, therapy, with, with counseling, with psychology, is that um, I wasn't sure what to expect. And so one of the things I want to share with you is that therapy does not have to be some weird thing. It doesn't have to be something that you feel like is not approachable therapy with the right therapist. And I have a therapist that's in this office building that I go down to 
probably about once a month. Sometimes I need more of a tune-up. Sometimes if we have a relational skirmish in our office, we'll have two people go to therapy. And that's something I learned on podcast episode number four with Brad Allen. If you haven't heard that podcast, go back. It's way in the archives, but Brad Allen and Eric Rollo and myself all joined for a live podcast in South Carolina at Brad's office in Columbia, South Carolina. So therapy has been huge. And Brad suggested it to me because his wife is in counseling, his wife is in therapy. And it's just a way of sharing your frustrations, sharing all the stuff that's going on. And when you communicate that, when you share it, all of a sudden it doesn't feel so bad anymore. It doesn't feel like it's so scary. It doesn't feel like the world is closing in on you. So therapy was one of the big poll results. So 30 under 30s, thank you so much for adding your two or three cents as you voted. If you would like to vote on what makes your happy place, just go ahead and send us an email at info at calibrate.re.com. Again, I-N-F-O at calibrate.re. And just put in the subject of the line, find your or find my happy place and say what your happy place is. I'd love to know it. If we didn't mention it, I would love to know what your happy place is. And I promise I will share it on an episode if you'd like me to share it. If you want to remain anonymous, you just want to send me a note. That's okay too. All right. So Kayla Davis will tabulate those results and we'll put that out there of finding your happy place. I'm Kyle Malnati, the podcast host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. For our podcast producer, Kayla Davis, who is constantly working to make this content great, and the cast of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have been guests, who regularly subscribe. I just say thank you for making this podcast episode number 77 great. I'm going to close this podcast out with two things. I'm going to close it out with a quote, and I'm going to close it out because this is episode number 77 with NHL players that wore number 77. So Colorado Avalanche and Boston Bruin player Ray Bork was famous for wearing number 77. So number 77, Ray Bork, but Ray Bork wore that as a tribute to famous New York Ranger, Phil Esposito. And there's lots of different people who wore the number 77. There's actually an article out there that there are 41 players that are pretty famous in the hockey ranks, one of which TJ Oshie, who's out there right now playing for the Washington Capitals, wears 77. It's kind of a funny number, but episode number 77, there you go. Hockey reference, Happy Gilmore, just tied it together. Love it. All right. So finally, a Bible verse. Now, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I don't want to beat you over the head with my spirituality, but I will tell you that not only meditation, but prayer is huge for finding your happy place, for resetting, for calibrating, and finding your way. So Psalm, and a lot of the Psalms are written by King David, you know, David with Goliath and, you know, uh, knocking the giant down. But King David was one of the more powerful people in the Old Testament. And in Psalm 23, one through three, is paraphrased by the Lord is my shepherd, I shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. So again, the Lord makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Psalm 23 verses one through three. So if you need some still waters, if you need some calm, maybe you need a spa day. <laughs> so again, I'm Kyle Malnati, host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. Thank you to Kayla Davis for producing. And as I love to say, we will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks everybody for tuning in.